Good morning. Welcome. Uh, we're glad that you're here for this final Sunday of 2019. Uh, how many of you had a great Christmas? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Why? Well, yeah. Great time celebrating the birth of Jesus, exchanging some gifts, enjoying some good food. I hope, I hope that you had a great, great Christmas. Next Sunday, we begin a new series called Kingdom of Light. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul is encouraging the Christians, and he tells them, he says, God the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people, in the kingdom of light. He says he's delivered you from the dominion of darkness. And so we're going to spend a few weeks talking about the kingdom of light, the dominion of darkness. We're going to talk about the spiritual that I think sometimes we've kind of shied a little bit away from. And so we're going get, to get into that over the next few weeks. Um, I tend to be kind of uh, contemplative this time of year. It's this odd short time between Christmas and the new year, uh, one year transitioning to the next. And I don't really uh, like to call them resolutions, but I do try to look back and say, hey, what are some wins from this past year? What are some losses? And thank God for the wins and evaluate the losses and, and consider, hey, are there some things that I could have done just a little bit differently? And and one of the passages that tends to be helpful to me, and hopefully will be helpful to you, is uh, Romans chapter 12. And it's a good, a good text to kind of use as evaluation and introspection and just kind of consider, hey, what, what are some things that I could be working on towards this next year? Now, before we get into the text or the first main point, I want to give you this quote. Now, I've mentioned this a few times this last year, but I want to remind you of it as we get started today. Uh, what happens in me, uh, what happens to me is not nearly as important as what happens in me. Remember that from a few times this last year? What happens to me is not nearly as important as what happens in me. And the idea is this. As we look back over the last year, oftentimes people will say, well, you know, it was a great year because this happened to me. It was a great year because these things happened to me. Or you know what? It wasn't a very good year. It was a bad year because this happened to me or to us. And we tend to kind of gauge the year, or gauge, whether it was a good year or a bad year, uh, on the things that happened to us. Uh, oftentimes things that were very much outside of our control. And so I want to tell you today as we get started, I, I think that's kind of backwards. It's not nearly as important what happens to us as what happens in us during this time. So today we want to kind of flip things around as we look forward to 2020. I want you to keep in mind your, your happiness, fulfillment, success, the things that you enjoy in life are, really shouldn't be as tied to what happens to you as to what happens in you. That's the most important thing as, as God is able to work in us. So that being said, I do think there are some things that we can do to better prepare ourselves for God to do what he wants to do in us in 2020. So that's kind of the idea, the premise for the message today that we're going to use Romans chapter 12 as an outline. So 2020, best year yet. Here's the first point, and then we'll get into the text in a moment. Dedicate my body. I need to dedicate my body. I'm going to get personal for just a moment in this first point today. We're in church. Uh, maybe you're thinking, why are we talking about our body? Uh, you're supposed to be talking about the soul. I mean, we're, we're spiritual beings, right? And supposed to be talking about the soul. That's the most important thing for the follower of Jesus Christ is their soul and the status of their soul, the, the, how their soul is doing. Well, I would agree with you that's the most important thing, but while we are living and breathing in here on this earth, your soul is intricately entwined with your physical body. Would you agree? So anything that God wants to do in you and through you spiritually, your body is going to come along for the ride. It's just how it works. Now, one day, you're, uh, you're, you're going to pass away, and your body is going to be returned to the earth from which God created, and your soul is going to uh, live forever in the presence of Almighty God. That's going to be a good day for those who believe. But in the in-between, in the meantime, while we're still here on this earth, your, your body, your soul are going to be in close proximity to one another. And so any commitment that you make, any spiritual commitment that you make, your body, it's, it's also a physical, you, it requires the cooperation of your physical body. Your body is along for the ride. This is the time of year that uh, many people start thinking about uh, gym membership. Anybody uh, want to be honest today? And uh, Anybody ever joined a gym this time of year and then only gone for a few times and yet maybe continued to pay out that membership for several months? Am, am I the only one in the room that's done that? A, a few different times in my life? I won't tell you how many times or how long I paid that out because 
Well, we're going to do a financial stewardship series later in the year, and I don't want that to catch up with me then. But uh, often, I think that's what keeps gyms in business is this time of year. People start to personally evaluate. They consider, what are some things I should be doing? Uh, I need to join a gym. I need to get a trainer and those kinds of things. And you know what? That's a good thing. But we do. We, we tend to think more and focus more and want to take better care of our physical body. Even if you are a Christ follower... And your soul, obviously, is the most important thing. There's got to be some emphasis. We've got to still continue to take good care of our body. God needs your body in order for your soul to be able to do some of the things that God wants to do in you and through you and with you. So you've got to take care of your body. What if I said to you after we leave church this morning, meet outside here, and I say, hey, let's get breakfast Tuesday morning, 6 o'clock. I'll see you at Randy's Diner on North. Hey, I'll see you there. Tuesday morning comes, and you're sitting there at Randy's, and I'm not there. And maybe you think, well, he's running a little bit late, which uh, confession is, is common for me. Uh, 6.30 rolls around. I'm still not there. And so you pick up the phone and call me. Hey, Seth, I'm here at Randy's Diner at 6.30. Where are you? Oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm in bed. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm there with you in spirit. That wouldn't fly, would it? That wouldn't work. Uh, well, we can't do that either you know what, I'm going to make this commitment in my heart. <laughs> I'm going to make this commitment in my spirit. Yeah, I'm, I, we've got to recognize that our physical body, our soul are intricately linked together. We can't use that excuse that, you know what, I'm making this commitment in my mind, in my heart, in my soul without understanding it's, it's going to require our physical body as well. God inspired the Apostle Paul to write some words along these lines. And so that's where we're going to start. Romans chapter 12, the first part of verse 1. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. Now that word to offer, those two words to offer, the, the word in the original language means to commit or to reserve. To reserve, like to make a reservation. So if you were to call up a fine restaurant, and by the way, what's a fine restaurant? Somebody give me a name. Fine restaurant. What's that? El Bistro, El Bistro Italiano, downtown, Main Street. A fine restaurant. I assume they take reservations. It's been a while since I've been there. But let's say you call up El Bistro and say, hey, I'd like to make a reservation. Uh, we're going to be there. Uh, we're going to bring the pastor along, because um, that's what you do, right? Uh, to a fine restaurant. At Tuesday night at 6 p.m., we'd like to make a reservation. They're going to write down your name and the time. And Tuesday evening, I don't know exactly how they do it. They might even put a little reserved sign on the table with your name on it and my name saying, hey, 6 p.m., this table is reserved so that no one else sits there. It's reserved. It's committed for you. The word that Paul uses here is, is in the same context of a, as a reservation. He's saying, hey, that's what this word means to offer is to reserve this body is reserved. It's committed across the board. This body is reserved for God. I'm taking care of it, but it belongs to God. The things that I do with this physical body, it's reserved for God. And so I don't know if you know this, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your body does not belong to you. It belongs to God. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I want to veer over for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, Paul writes these words there, and we actually used these verses as an outline for a series a few years ago. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who's in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your body is a temple for God's Holy Spirit. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. I heard somebody once say, that, well, I'm a megachurch. Uh, you know, so Forget I said that, please. <laughs> However, um, you understand the context here. God bought you with a price, and so your body doesn't belong to you. You've got to take care of the temple. Um, I want to ask a, a personal question, and I don't know if I'm violating any HIPAA laws, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, how many of you have ever been to the doctor, sat in the doctor's office, and they have said to you something along the lines of, hey, uh, something has come up here, and your cholesterol, your blood work, uh, something with your heart, diet, exercise, you, th there's some things that you need to do. Anybody had that conversation? There's some, there's some things that you need to do to, to course correct, 
to fix some things. And there are some things that you can do to fix this, that you need to work on to fix this. Now, I noticed anyone that raised their hand, most of you are over 40. That's how it works, right? So, so, something happens along the way to many of us, and there's, there's, there's work that we can do to help our physical body. It just happens to all of us. I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but those physical gut check moments, those are not just physical gut check moments. Those are spiritual gut check moments as well. God is saying, hey, there's some things that you need to take care of. Take care of my temple. Uh, The second part of uh, verse 1, Romans 12, he continues. uh, In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You ever thought about a, a living sacrifice? Dead sacrifices are a whole lot easier. Now, don't misunderstand me there. Don't get me wrong, but we could say, God, I'm, I'm yours. My life is yours. Do with me what you want. But God, uh, just go ahead and take me now. <laughs> I mean, I don't think God does that, okay? But um, I know God doesn't do that. However, if, if it was just a, a dead sacrifice situation, it's a one-time, done type thing. But Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It's an ongoing, repeated, day after day, moment after moment, daily sacrifice. I heard a pastor say this one time, the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. We've got to be willing, day by day, week by week, moment by moment, to put ourselves on the altar and allow God to do what He wants to do. It's not about me, it's about the Lord. Got to be doing what he's called me to do. Paul continues. He says, holy and pleasing to God. Talking about offering your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. In other words, it is, uh, it is a joy to God. It makes God happy when you commit yourself to him. Your taking care of the temple is pleasing to God. Paul continues. He says, this is your true and proper worship. This is a way that you can worship God. When you take care of the body, for a Christ follower, when you take care of the temple, it's a form of worship, an act of worship. You know, uh, sometimes we we, we might say this, you know what, Um, I just don't understand people who use uh, meth. I would never do meth. Uh, Meth will mess you up. I mean, we're to take care of the temple of God, and so don't do meth, don't do drugs. And then we will go and we will overeat, and we will not exercise, and we will drink too much, and we will smoke and do other things that are harmful to our body, but we will act spiritual because we're not doing meth. Now, I'm not saying that we need to all be able to run a marathon, or that we all need to be uh, overly, completely obsessed with how we look, but there is an element to this because that's what the text says, that we're to be taking care of the body. This doesn't mean that you have to become a vegan, okay? Okay. Uh, it's not even in the Bible, by the way, okay? <laughs> if you are a vegan, God loves you. Okay, I love you. you know, but... <laughs> so, someone, uh, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, why not? Someone said, do you know how uh, y- y- you can always tell when someone is a vegan because you don't have to ask, they will tell you. Uh, is that... Okay. <laughs> Please don't be offended. I, I uh, But here's my point. You do not have to be completely obsessed with your health or completely obsessed with your physical appearance. But I am saying, because the text says it, we are to take care of the temple. We're to take care of our physical body. It's holy and pleasing to God. It's an act of worship. In fact, worshiping God is is not simply coming on Sunday morning to church. In fact, I would say that's maybe just a simple, simple starting point. It's not coming to church on Sunday and singing and uh, taking communion together, and giving an offering, encouraging one another. Worship of God is a daily activity, and much of that worship can be, God, here, here, this, this is me. I'm offering me to you. I'm going to take care of the body. So today, or during the next hour, my worship of you is, is going to be some physical exercise. I'm going to get outside, or I'm going to go to the gym, or I'm going to watch my diet, whatever it may be. You know what? These hands are not my own. These feet are not my own. These eyes are not my own. I'm going to worship you by by exercising today. God, this body is not my own. It's yours, but use me for your glory. I think for many of us, 2020 could be your best year yet 
if we started to do some temple care. Here's the second thought today. Best year yet, prioritize my time. Prioritize my time. If I want this year to be the best year yet, I've got to, and maybe you've got this figured out already, but I've got to figure out a way to better prioritize my time. There's a phrase that's been going around for a a long time, and it's just simply this, uh, you you can have it all. You can have it all. Um, I, I don't think that's true. You cannot have it all. You can try. You can try to do it all. You can try to have it all. But if you go down that pathway, you're going to give up some things that are very important. As you pursue to have it all, you're going to lose some things that are extremely important. Your marriage, your relationship with your kids, the the ability to do excellence or or to, to perform excellently in other areas of your life. If you lose track of the priorities... So if you want 20 to 20 to be your best year yet, you've got to better prioritize your time. You've got to eliminate some things. You know, every time you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. So figure out a way to prioritize your time. Paul continues, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. In other words, uh, don't just do that everything that everybody else is doing. Don't pursue like everybody else is pursuing. Don't, Don't do what God wants you to do. Don't conform to the pattern of this world and and be about all of those things that everybody else is, but do what God wants you to do. Stay focused on the priorities that God wants you to be focused on, and then you will better understand His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Which leads me to say, again, if you, are, if you are pursuing everything, you're missing out on some things. If you're saying yes to everything, you're saying no to some things that God wants you to do. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone that is crazy driven and maybe even uh, considers himself superhuman. And you know what? I can do it all. I, I'm going to pursue it all. I, I'm just trying to help you out here this morning. You've got to choose wisely. You've only got so much time. So choose wisely what you're going to do with your time and get the most out of it. If you don't prioritize and put the important things in first in your schedule, you're going to miss out on those things later on. So if you want God's blessing in 2020, uh, well, prioritize God first. Prioritize God. Put Him first every day. Put Him first every week. Put Him first in every area of your life and then watch Him work. And allow him to bless you in those other areas of your life. And as you receive his blessing and experience his blessing, then focus more on what he's blessed you to do or what he's gifted you to do. You'll get a much better return on your time. Here's a phrase that you might latch on to this year. In order to wisely use the time God gives you, I must be honest about my strengths. In order to wisely use the time God gives me, I must be honest about my strengths. We have a tendency to go to uh, one of two extremes. Sometimes we will think, well, uh, we're indispensable. You know what, I'm I'm indispensable. We are not indispensable. Jesus said once upon a time in Luke chapter 19, he said, if the people will not praise the Lord, the rocks will cry out. I might be paraphrasing a stretch a little bit here, but if the people will not praise the Lord, God will raise up the rocks to praise him. If God can replace you with a rock, you are not indispensable, okay? None of us are indispensable. That's one extreme. The far other extreme is people will say something to the effect of, well, I'm worthless. You are not worthless. You are far from worthless. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, not one sparrow falls to the ground without the Father noticing. And you are worth far more than many sparrows. You are not indispensable You are not worthless. God's word is, however, trying to right-size things for us and help us to remember our place. That's what the Apostle Paul does as well. Verse uh, 3. He says, For by grace, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So have a right idea of who you are. A right-sized version of things. Well, how is this, uh, why is this, how is this working its way into a New Year's sermon? Here's why. I believe a lot of us burn up way too much time doing things that we're not good at. 
Now, I'm not talking about not pursuing learning or getting better at some things, but what about in 2020 if we focused on, spent more time on, a, a, a larger portion of our time doing the things that God has blessed us to do and focusing on the gifts God has blessed us with as well? Now, someone after first service walked up to me and said, Seth, I'm, if I'm understanding you right, um, I'm really great at burning brownies and cookies. So is that a smile on their face? But you get what I'm saying. I mean, focus more of your time on what you're good at, on what you're gifted at, at what you're blessed to do, and watch the return come back. I probably uh, don't have to talk about this too long for you to get where I'm going, but professional athletes, many of them are very specialized You've got punters and kickers and quarterbacks when it comes to football, and you've got pitchers in baseball or, or designated hitters or whatever it may be in those sports and, and other sports. It goes across the board. They're very specialized people in each of those areas, and they may be horrible at the rest of the game. Maybe a pitcher can't bat for anything, but he can pitch like crazy, and so he's going he's gonna to have a multi-million dollar salary every year simply for his, not simply, for his giftedness and ability and, and talent when it comes to pitching. He's going to focus on that. He's going to utilize that. He's going to continue to get better at that. So all I'm saying is what if we recognize the things that we're gifted for, uh, blessed with, and we focus more of our time in those areas, kind of a stay in your lane approach, stay in your sweet spot as much as possible and allow God to work in those areas of giftedness and blessing. Here's number three today, uh, best year yet. Do life together, do life together. I know sometimes things get difficult and messy when we do life together, but I'm challenging you, I'm pushing you, find a way to do life together. If you want 2020 to be your best year yet, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are living the Christian life alone, you are not, you are not in line with what God has designed for you. Find a way to do life together. We live in a very uh, high-tech world today, don't we? And we as a church, we, we put sermons online. Uh, if people miss a message or they're, they're traveling or sick or, or they want to review something or share something, we put those online so that people can share. There are many churches, we've experimented with this. It just hasn't been a good fit for us. Facebook Live and YouTube Live and other ways to put their services online live. I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing. But if we're not careful, sometimes we can get up on a Sunday morning and say, you know what, I, rather than go to church today, I'm just going to just going to connect in and log on and, and watch a service online today instead of going to church. And then the next week, it might be, well, that was kind of nice. I, you know, this morning, I don't even have to get dressed. I can watch church and participate in my PJs. And it, but what happens is over a period of time, something meant for good to be convenient for people when they've missed or something becomes an option that they lean into and they become very quickly disconnected from a church body. We've got to be doing life together instead of like this guy here of having to wake up, get dressed, and drive across town just to attend your favorite service? Introducing Virtual Reality Church. Start by choosing a church building that meets your needs. Tired of the stress of having to choose a Sunday morning outfit? Never make a fashion mistake again because Virtual Reality Church will style you based on your denomination. Not a people person? Select the introvert experience to completely eliminate the welcome team, meet and greet time, connect cards, and that awkward hold hands with the person next to you thing we still do. Next, personalize your morning by choosing the worship experience that you want. Feeling a touch of white guilt? Add a minority worship leader. Custom options even let you tailor the skinniness of your worship leader's jeans. Finally, no more having to endure songs that you don't like. With Virtual Reality Church, you're in charge. For the sermon, choose the amount of conviction you'd like and we'll select a pastor for you. We'll even let you tailor your sermon topics so you'll never have to attend a Vision Sunday or a sermon series on giving. And never worry again about dozing off during the sermon. With Virtual Reality Church, you can sleep as long as you want. Kids being bad in nursery? Who cares? Worried about missing a football game? Enter your favorite team and we'll provide notifications when the game is starting. Never miss a kickoff again. Want to go for for prayer? Well, if you selected a Pentecostal service, always stand in front of a mattress. Even connect your social media accounts and we'll post for you. Get credit for being super spiritual all from the comfort of your couch. Finally, an option for people asking the question, how can I make Sunday morning even more about me? Virtual Reality Church, the future of church attendance. 
I don't know if you've seen John Christ. Yes, he's a professional Christian comedian. It's a joke, okay? But uh, I saw that video several months ago, and I thought, that, that's, that's pretty funny stuff there. Uh, if you're offended by that, then, um, well, I, we, we can talk about it, but probably not very long. Okay, it's funny stuff. Let's just be honest. Um, you know, a, a high, a, the high-tech world we live in can be a great thing, can be a good thing. And so I'm, I'm happy that we can connect with people in many ways. But if you are not connecting with one another, if you're not getting together as a church body, then, then figure that out this year. Find a way to be better connected with other people. The church is a gathering of people. It's meant to be a body of people. In fact, that's how Paul continues, verses 4 and 5. For just, of each of, just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, Form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. As a body, we've got to work together. We've got to encourage one another. We've got to be together. And when we come together to worship God, to worship Christ, to make Him known to other people, we are able to accomplish so much more than we could ever accomplish on our own. So, 2020, here's my point. If you're in town, be in church. If you're traveling or something, I, I get that, but if you're in town, be in church, gather together with other believers. Here's something I know about people. When it is, uh, if and when it is all about them, then it will be more convenient to stay home. If and when it is about God and serving others and being connected with other people and there's a responsibility and ownership there, then people will show up and they will serve and they will be a part of the body gathering together. Paul continues, verses six through eight. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. In other words, do what God has gifted you to do. Utilize the gifts he's given you and serve in those areas. When you do what God has gifted you to do, it's a blessing to others. It glorifies God. And, and you yourself see a return on that. You experience the blessing of helping other people. So if you want to live outside of yourself, serve other people. Make it about other people. Here's a, a very simple, easy way to serve some other people. Invite somebody to church. As simple as that may sound, it's a way to help serve someone else. We have a new series next, year, uh, next uh, Sunday. Invite somebody to church. And along the way, as they come here and and sing songs about Jesus or hear songs about Jesus. They'll hear the word preached about Jesus. Hopefully, they will come to a, a place where they can experience life to the full in Jesus. And you will have been a part of their, their forever being changed. I want to close out by reading the final uh, verses of Romans chapter 12. And you could, if you haven't seen something already that connects with you for 2020, then I would I would. I would guess there's a phrase here at the end of chapter 12 that you could latch on to that might be personal for you. So starting in verse 9, Paul says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Maybe this is, that's your phrase for this year. You know what? I'm going to cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I feel like I have lost a little bit of that spiritual fervor. So keep your zeal. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. If you're going through physical difficulty, some health issues, maybe that's your phrase this year. You know what? I'm going to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. He continues, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Maybe this year you decide, you know what, we're, we're going to be more hospitable. We're going to have some people into our home and, and care for them and feed them and, and just love on them. He continues, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. That's hard. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. There's a few other ideas as he wraps up chapter 12. Maybe you can read those later, but I just want to encourage you, 2020 could be your best year yet if you would focus in some of these areas to better prepare yourself for what God wants to do in you. Here's the takeaway this week. What can you do to be better prepared for what God wants to do in you in 2020? What's something that you can do, that you can be working on to be better prepared for what God wants to do in you and through you in 2020? 
Would you stand with me today? We're going to pray.